Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. All right. Good morning. 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 Before Rob gets here, he should be here in about a minute or so. Let me just give you a little market update. Um, we had a good week in the bond market. CPI came in, yeah, rates are looking good. Uh, came in a little bit under what the anticipation was. So it put a lot of, uh, it actually gave a lot of relief to the treasuries, which are trading. The yield is probably at about 425, which definitely came down. Rates have come down this week. So it was good. The Fed meeting um, went okay. Uh, they're still cautious moving forward. Um, they obviously, uh, reduced their rate cuts this year from three to one, but they did add one more rate cut for next year. So we'll see what happens there. Anticipating a uh, a four four point uh, a four rates cut rate cut next year. So we'll see. Um, so rates are actually looking good. Um, you know, it, it's just a it's just anytime the market rallies like this. We pass along the good news to the borrowers, and hopefully, it takes some you know takes these folks off the fence. And uh, we can have a great weekend for some showing. So let's pass on the good good news that rates have come down this week. And uh, typically anywhere between an eighth and a quarter percent in rates. Rates are probably a little under 6% now. They're still trading at that 7% range, but we are seeing rates in the sixes now. So it's more the sixes versus the seven. So it's it was a good week for the bond market. So let's, uh, let's go out, spread the good word, and let's have a great weekend. This video of you. Hitting a game winning buzzer. Is always welcome. Always, always welcome. Good news is always welcome. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a great time to reach out to those fe uh, those fence sitters. Like Frank said, it's a you know a loan amount of maybe five hundred thousand. Um, going from seven and a half to seven or seven to six and a half, it's going to save them about one hundred thirty dollars, one hundred forty dollars a month. So this is a great talking point and a reason to touch those you know make those calls. For you know, you sometimes you you guys may feel like you're pestering these clients that say they're they're not ready, they're not ready, they're not ready. But like Frank said, like Frank this said this is great great news to talk about, um, especially those people that you know, may not be qualifying. You know, those ones that are on the cusp. This is the owner. Let me show you him now. I'll show you him when he comes out. But yeah, they had some dumb questions on Friday. And I never make sometimes I'm having coffee. Get yourself. Yeah. The next level. I can't Just tell them I'll be on a second ahead and go meet people. All right. Rob is coming on very shortly. So all right. Good morning. 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 All right. I just muted everybody. I turn your volume off. Um, sound, sound check. Can you guys hear me all right? Fantastic. Loud and clear. Yep. Yep. So um, today is uh, in, uh, in Florida. I had two great sessions with our uh, teams down there talking about the uh, NAR conversation and how to work with our buyers in this time of uh, uncertainty, um, confusion, and uh, I think we made a lot of progress. I wanted to deliver seven specific scripts or conversations that we could have with our clients to help them feel comfortable moving forward. And before I started that, what I went to look at was the NAR um, profile of buyers and sellers. I'm going to take a moment and share my screen. Here, here is the NAR profile. Right. Oh, okay. okay, here you go. Buyers and sellers. God, you're such a pain in the ass. No, I'm not going away. What the fuck do I... Okay. There we are. Everybody's back to muted. Um, so... This is um, from both the Florida and the NAR. It compares them both. And unfortunately, this is from the one that was released in July of last year. So I expect a new one coming out next month. But um, this is what buyers that limit uh, clients from completing a transaction. 
uh, lack of inventory, housing affordability, and uh, expectations that prices might fall. And um, rounding out the top would be difficulty finding the right property and expectation that mortgage rates might come down. Hey, Rob, before you continue, could you just make this a little bit bigger? Sure. So that old people like me can see what it says. That better there? Much better. Thank you. So lack of inventory. Can we control that? Um, housing affordability. Can we control that? Um, expectations that prices might uh, further fall. Can we control that? I'm seeing uh, some people shaking their head no. Um, expectation that mortgage rates might come down. Can we control that? And difficulty finding the right property. That's probably the one that we really can control, right? But I'm going to break some. Uh, I'm, I'm going to break rank with some traditional wisdom. Uh, lack of inventory. If you were to ask the the home buyer. You know, how much is the inventory down from, you know, five years ago when the market was normal? What do you think we'd get as a response? Anybody? 30%. 30 I, mean, I think people would say it's probably down 90% because five years ago, you could probably see six houses in a day. And now, Ron, you're calling me saying I have to leave work early to see it today, right? If it's the right house. Maybe in Florida, it's starting to change a little bit, but I think... Um, the public probably over exaggerates the lack of inventory. Um, and I really think that, you know, it's inventory is coming. It's just not staying. Right. So in other words, you just need a different buying pattern for addressing the lack of inventory. Um, housing affordability. Yeah. Housing affordability is um, housing is becoming less affordable. Um, but I think what we need to frame it in is what's the alternative? And, um, you know, uh, if somebody decides not to buy, what's the alternative? I don't know, Juan, are you muted or no? I see you might be unmuted. You want to unmute yourself, Juan, or Ron? What's the, what's the alternative if they don't buy for most people? They'll rent. They'll continue to rent. And is rental affordability also going down? Oh, no. Nope. So I think, you know, if you compare, you know, rent, rent prices going up, home prices going up, you have an affordability challenge in, in both scenarios. The, um, the role that we need to play is the educator, the informer, right? And do most people plan on living in a region or a home for a certain period of time? Um, I would think looking at the um, cost of ownership or cost of renting over a period of time is a very significant and relevant conversation to have. Um, you know, I don't think looking at the next 12 months is the whole conversation. I think it's, if you plan on being there for seven years, we got to talk about what's the cost of ownership over the period of seven years. Does that make sense? And um, for home ownership, in a large part, the cost of ownership, um, you know, excluding taxes and insurance is either stable or it could even go down, right? Because you can take a, a swipe at refinancing once or twice. So I think housing affordability, check the box for, for buying. Lack of inventory, check the box for you need me. You need our profession when there's a lack of inventory because what we do is we help consumers navigate a complex and sometimes confusing transaction, right? And I want us to, I want this to sink into our head. You know, there really isn't a lack of inventory. There's just a lack of the right strategy to be the successful home buyer in this crazy market. Um, expectations that prices may fall. Can we influence that? I think we can help manage people's expectations because that's just all in their head. 
So, so look, this is very interesting, Amy. You're newer in the business, and uh, some of the the uh, uh, more senior people in the business are shaking their heads, saying, "No, we can't." But I agree with you. I think we can educate them. And if, on average, home prices over the past fifty years have gone up five point one percent in Florida and five point five in New Jersey, what do you think the next five years or fifteen or fifty years is going to look like? probably going to go up by a similar number, right? So um, so those of you who are shaking your head no, do you think that we might be able to influence a um, home buyer's perception that prices might fall? And Ron, I noticed you were shaking your head. Do you think that we have a opportunity or maybe even a moral obligation to educate them so that they don't act in fear? Well, you can do, yeah, you can educate them the best you can. Uh, but if somebody's got a price because their neighbor sold next door or in the neighborhood that sold higher, they're going to give you a hard time. Um, but Ryan, the, the, question, the question was, and I want to just repeat it because maybe I wasn't clear, but if consumers have a fear over their over the tenure, the tenure that they own a home, that prices might fall further. Oh, I see. So do you think yes. that we yeah, have a no, duty? I, I think that's true. Right. Nothing is certain. I mean, Earth can get hit by a meteor and it not turn around tomorrow. But it, it's highly likely that <clears> in <throat> the last 50 years, it's gone up. And if for the last six recessions, homes have gone up significantly, that we have a duty to educate our consumers. And that might take away one of those fears that they have. Okay. Um, well, and it's so very we can uh, we can work on that bit, say if the people have the knowledge and uh, what's going on and certainly uh, if you have the stats you know uh, a lot of people here on Broward they asked me this morning I had a discussion as a matter of fact that over a breakfast there with somebody that he thought oh we're waiting for the market to crash so I told him mm -hmm. I said the market's not going to crash first of all because we have no inventory here in Broward. Second of all, there are people keep coming in with a lot of money. And third of all, uh, Florida is the number one in the country that they have the most cash transaction. So people that they pay in cash for these properties, they're not going to walk away, that they're not going to walk away. So the market uh, is going to be either, it's still going up here, but certainly has stabilized tremendously because in 21, we had 26.5% increase in 22 we had 22 and a half percent increase but last year we only had about six seven percent which is normal in some places they had 10 percent but most of it that's normal when it's in a single digit so once you educate the people about all this information that we have certainly you know if they are serious they will do something that they will do all right so so um, at a minimum, Tony, we have the opportunity to educate and influence, right? I don't think we have the power to completely change. No. But I believe, but I believe an educated person is going to have a, a different opinion than, oh, the, mar the market went up for four years in a row with COVID. It's going to it obviously has to crash. Um, tell that to people who've been buying NVIDIA. Yeah. Right, well, how's that, how's yeah. that strategy working for you there, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it's funny that you say that because uh, every week I keep up with the numbers and uh, uh, what you call their, uh, the number, the, the people that 50% of the new inventory gets sold within 30 days that gets sold. And, uh, and that's what people don't see. And that's why, like you said, the inventory is down. That's because like now, yesterday I showed one house there. And uh, I've been on the market maybe a week there, even under the rain and all that. <laughs> People saw the house and say, oh, this is a nice house. They already sent me an offer that they already sent me an offer. So, yeah, homes, they keep going very quick, very fast. So, Tony, so, so what you're saying, educa education is going to um, limit some of the fears. So we look at this um, lack of inventory. I think we can um, address that by having a different strategy for negotiating on the right house when it comes on the market because you know if there were six million homes traded in 2019 or 18 and now there's going to be 4.2 it's less than a third reduction in the amount of homes that are being sold so there's still 
to the third less inventory. So that means you need to be more um, deliberate and intentional in how you make offers on the property that you intend to purchase. And if you are educated on the macro trends of how uh, housing performs relative to inflation and how it uh, is a great hedge against inflation and how over time real estate always goes up, that would um, eliminate for most people their concern that prices might fall or might fall further. So we've, we've knocked out um, lack of inventory. We've locked out houses might fall. Um, housing affordability. Um, if you go up here, it says limiting potential clients in completing a transaction is lack of affordability. I mean, if they're renting and the prices are going to continue to go up, why not bite the bullet and go into home ownership where you at least have some certainty and control over your housing? And my conversation might go something like this. Hey, Amy, how important is having control over your future housing payments to you and your spouse? Very. Now, that conversation follows by, you know, maybe, maybe if it was, you know, 10% more in the first year, but five years from now, it was 30% less. Would that be something that you might be, can, might be interested in undertaking, Amy? And Definitely. then you go over how those numbers work because rents go up over time. I've never seen a substantial period of time where rents have not gone up. It just doesn't happen. So lack of inventory, housing affordability, it's not, a, I mean, it's less affordable. It's definitely a lot less affordable than it was, but what's the alternative? And let's look at it over a, a uh, the period that you intend to own the home. Like what's the total cost of ownership over the tenure that you're going to be in the home? Um, expectation that prices might fall further. I think education solves for that problem. You know, maybe in the next six to 18 months, prices might have a modest decline. But in five years, I feel highly confident that they're going to be substantially higher than they are today. Um, expectation that, that mortgage rates might come down. And this is a factor limiting clients from completing a transaction. So these are people on the sidelines waiting for rates to come down. We've got this one, right, team? Do we have this one? Because if we wait for rates to come down, what's going to happen to the competition, Amy? Okay. Well, competition meaning what? Will there be no, more? Will there no, be one's more? A for, no one's a fortune teller. So if you're going to wait for that, you're going to be so, out of so luck. If, so Amy, our, our education, and, and we're going to, we went over this last Friday, but if, if rates go down, there will be more buyers in the market. That's pretty certain more competition right that means that there's going to be more competition if there's more competition and homes are more affordable because the rates are slightly lower what's that going to do to prices it's going to force them up right right oh yeah so so ironically clients are this is a limiting factor for clients to, to take action and buy when it really should be a motivating factor instead of a limiting factor when you break it down would you would you agree? And if there's anybody that doesn't, I'd like to just have this conversation because, you know, my famous, you know, two headed coin, you know, hey, Ron, if if, if I flip the coin, heads you win, tails you win. Would you would you take that bet? Or, if it, was a two, or if it was a two headed coin, I said, Ron, the two headed coin, you call it, you're going to call heads every time. So um, the system is stacked in your favor because if rates go down, what are we going to do? Refi. Refinance, right? And if rates go up from 7 to 9, 11, and 18% like they were 20 years ago, how would you feel if you had a 7 and the rates went to 9 or 11? That's pretty good. You'd feel good about that, right, Ron? Of course. So I think I, I, think I, um, I, think I got you off the sideline. Okay, I've... Um, I've addressed one of those objections. So we have rates coming down. Prices might fall. Finding the right property. Affordability and inventory. Mm -hmm. Finding the right property was the one that we all felt comfortable that we could address. So I humbly submit to you that I think we can address every single one of these um, limiting uh, 
factor is limiting clients from uh, transacting in this market, and it's through education and knowledge and, and data. <clears throat> so this is from the report. <clears throat> Buyers typically searched for 10 weeks, looked at a median of, of seven homes and viewed four uh, homes online. So keep in mind, this was 2022, okay, and the data from 2023. Finding the right home was the mo most difficult task for buyers at 59%. And 90% found their real estate agent to be uh, somewhat a very useful information source. Educating you on what the consumers are looking for. And this part here, the 10 week search, looking at seven homes. I don't know, I think that should probably be a maximum. And I think if we educate them on how things transact, we might be able to you help them find a home with less stress, a shorter period of time. And uh, that would be good for the client, their satisfaction and good for repeat business. Home buying and real estate professionals. Um, this was the public's perception or what they're looking for. Having an agent help them find the right home was what buyers most wanted when choosing an agent at 50%. It's a good stat. Public concerns about realist, realtors or complaints. Does it surprise anybody that communication is number one? I mean, I think when we deal with our peers, sometimes we feel that same communication frustration. Um, industry and or local real estate knowledge, and I should say lack of that is the concerns that they have. Um, lack of commitment to our fiduciary duty of trust and care, negotiation skills, and professionalism. So when we have our buyer's consultation, what do you think that we should have a high level of um, intent on eliminating? The fears that we won't communicate. We want to highlight that we know, understand, and can explain the industry and local market trends. We want to highlight our fiduciary duty and how we take that very seriously. We want to um, demonstrate and show how negotiation skills can not only you know, potentially save them time and money, but also can be the, um, be the conduit for them getting the home that they want. And all of these things go into the professionalism of our industry. Can you go back up to the one before? Because I was reading it. Go back up to what? Yeah, this one, 43%. This or, or... No, no, no. Uh, right here, 40... 40, no, the next one. Having okay. an agent to help, yeah, that. 43% of buyers use an agent. Okay. That was how Thanks. they found their agent. So that takes me down to ask a better question, get a better outcome. Um, and the North Star or your guiding force would be, how can I help this person navigate a complex and confusing transaction? How can I help this person navigate a complex and confusing transaction? <clears throat> to have a repeatable and scalable business requires a plan. Planning to fail is plan. Excuse me. Failure to plan is planning to fail, and proper preparation prevents poor performance. Um, so these are best techniques on maybe how to pivot from some of the questions that we ask. Um, question one is designed to eliminate the question, and hopefully nobody ever says to somebody, do you have an agent? Because do you have an agent is one of the biggest commission breath questions that's out there, right? So how do we, how do we avoid that? Um, we can do that by asking a question like, Amy, how have you been looking at home so far? Not how long, how? Oh, we've been going to open houses. Oh, we've been working with my my sister in law, you know Angela. So they will tell you if they have an agent, or they will give you strong clues. 
So I would say, try to eliminate, do you have an agent from your vocabulary? And re replace that with, how have you been looking at home so far? And instead of asking, how long have you been looking? Because a lot of people ask that same question, would you agree? Anybody? So I, I find a lot of people ask, how long have you been looking? Instead, when did you start your home search? So, so what, and what would be the, on the sell side, what would you say instead of asking, do you have an agent? I mean, for listings? Yeah. Or for buyers? No, for listings, if someone um, came up so, to me and had interest. So, so, um, yeah, obviously, if the house is listed, that's a strong indication that they have an agent. If no, the house no, but it, listing, we need to talk about intent, right? And, and Amy, I want to I want to keep this towards um, the buyer side, okay. just so that um, we we stay light, laser focused. Um, and uh, I can talk to you offline about that one. But are you planning on paying cash or financing instead of have you been pre-approved? Because what's the if you ask somebody, have you been pre-approved? Do they love that question or do they kind of get a little bit annoyed at times? Annoyed. Anybody? Yeah, annoyed. So are you planning on paying cash or financing? Um, if they don't know the answer to that, they might not have really done their homework, but that will give you clues so that you can um, provide value. Question number three. What have you seen that you have liked, that you liked? Now, obviously they haven't bought it or they wouldn't be with us. <clears throat> What's your biggest challenge so thus far? We're going into these things here, which most consumers have. Identifying the pain. <clears throat> then I, I highly recommend, hey, Amy, use their name. I'm really glad you said that because I want to make sure that you buy the right home, not the next home, right? Be, be of service. Don't be a transparently self-motivated car salesperson, okay? Be one that's concerned with providing value. Hey, Amy, I'm really glad you said that because I want to make sure you buy the right home, not the next home. Because they feel that you're just trying to get them to buy the next home so you can get your commission, thus commission breath. Now, here's the real money question. You know, um, has anyone taken the time to sit, to sit you down and review what it takes to be a successful buyer in today's market? Has anyone taken the time to sit you down and review what it takes to be a successful buyer in today's market? And from that flip chart, we talked about a lot of things about what it takes to be a successful buyer in this market and how to give you the tools to make the right decisions for you and your family, right? Let's schedule a strategy session. This is where you introduce the exclusive buyer agency agreement. I'm running right? Back. I'll be right back. You talk about the, um, you talk about, um, The public concerns, right? You know, I think in most most um, buyer uh, agency or home buyer consultations that we've done traditionally over time, we probably haven't talked about how we're going to communicate with them, right? And I, I would put myself as uh, guilty as charged with not really highlighting how I'm going to communicate. But do you think it's important for you to identify how you're going to communicate with your buyer, especially if you're expecting them to sign a uh, exclusive agreement. Very important. Of course. Right? Yep. Um, it, it's important to uh, identify your industry and local knowledge. It's important to discuss your fiduciary duty and how you're going to treat them because they don't know that we have, would you agree that most buyers don't know that we have a fiduciary duty to them? They just think that we're out there to make our own commission, right? So we should specifically talk about, hey, you know, if we if we enter into this agreement, this creates a fiduciary duty for me to act in your best interest. I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, you might want to highlight your negotiation skills 
And I think by asking all these questions, your professionalism will become self-evident. Your professionalism will become self-evident, will be unquestionable. <clears throat> so after you introduce or in the process of introducing your um, exclusive buyer agency agreement and talking about you know what it costs to work with us, because there is a fee, we shouldn't be afraid of our compensation or our fee. We should be uh, more concerned that we deliver a service and a value far in excess of the fee that we charge. Um, would it be helpful if I shared with you some sales and inventory trends for the type of home you're looking for in advance of us finding one and making an offer? Now, do you think that that is a, um, do you think that's something that most people do now? Do you think most people take the time to talk about if we find a home that meets your needs, how are we going to approach making an offer? I'm going to tell you, we don't. We typically, we, we run them around until they find the house that they want. And then it's all out panic fire drill to figure out how are we going to make that offer. But I think, would it be helpful if I shared with you some sales and inventory trends for the type of home you're looking for in advance of us finding one and making your offer? Folks, any any uh, feedback on that? Any thoughts? So, Rob, I have a, I have a little bit of feedback on um, the mention of what it costs to do business with us, uh -huh. you know, what, what our fee is going to be. Is that That's something that we have to be certain that we present in a very positive light and not apologetically. Um, because I think that weak agents will be a little uneasy about entering into that conversation. And I think our ability to present it in a very positive light goes towards our professionalism. Right. I mean, we can look at things, Robert, like, um, you know, in my local market, you know, I've, um, I've averaged 2.2 offers per offer accepted in the past six months. And there's typically nine offers on every property that goes under contract from my, you know, recent research. I mean, I think having stats like that is really helpful. Uh, if you are able to um, be in a market where you can negotiate better prices than homes that have sold, you can even say, hey, beyond that, you know, I'm able to negotiate 2.2% better than the rest of the market in Bootin or whatever your local market is by looking at your stats on the sales in Bootin compared to the ask price versus the rest of the market. So we have to use all the tools that are available to us, but in order to use all the tools that are available to us, we have to know about them, right? We have to do a little bit of research and preparation and homework, and then we can talk about what our value is and what our price is. So I think, Robert, you hit the nail on the head. You know, if you say my fee is 3% and you don't say that with confidence and you're not certain that that's what your service is worth, you probably won't get 3% you're going to get what we call sales resistance. People won't want to do it. People will say, well, that's great, but can you, my, my, my cousin Nelly will do it for 1%. Can you, can you match that, Robert? No. And who, so who, would, who would want to, um, who would want to address, like, you know, when I was working with our, our two groups of, uh, of, fantastic experienced agents down here in Southeast Florida. One of the things that um, uh, I want to see who, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, somebody had said that uh, they gave the example of a general, a mechanic on a ship who charged $20,000 to fix the engine. And uh, all he did was he went into the boiler room and he, he knew exactly where to go and he, tapped the hammer three times on it and the engine started up and the ship was back uh, on track and on course. And you dropped the bill for 20 grand. And they said, don't you think it's excessive to charge me $20,000 to do that? And he's like, well, you know, captain, I have to explain to you the, uh, 
you're not paying for me tapping the hammer three times. You're paying for my 34 years of experience to know exactly Which, where to tap so that the, uh, the engine will restart. And the relevance to that is people think that if you go and show me three houses and you make $20,000, isn't that a little bit excessive? And the answer, um, without being arrogant and, and maybe not even using the words, but the reality is it's the, you know, 17,000 hours that you spent in the industry that's going to help them get the right house at the lowest likely possible price and terms that they can do it at, right? So I thought that was a great analogy, and I just wish I could give credit to the person who said it. Anybody remember Mike, who said that one? Michael Eisner. Michael Eisner. Yes, <laughs> Michael Eisner. Great job. So um, would it be helpful if I shared with you, like, most of us don't go in how we're going to make a bid when we do find the house, because we're not even certain we're going to find them the house, because we're not even certain they're going to work with us. So there's a lot of uncertainty baked into that cake. And that cake's not going to taste very good and you're not going to be able to eat if you don't believe it. So you have to say, hey, let's talk about how we're going to make the offer when we find you the, the right house. And would you, would you be open to me sharing with you some trends so that we can come up with a strategy to help you win in a multiple bid situation? All right. Number six. Are you familiar with how the macro trends affect housing and your upcoming investment? Now this one here, I'm concerned that prices might fall further. I'm concerned about affordability. This one addresses um, both of those issues. Has anyone informed you of the risks and benefits of transacting in this environment? Now, I'm not going to show you the rest. What are the risks and benefits of transacting in this environment? This is where this is where I want some interaction. So I want to call on some of the people that, that I see your faces, but I don't want to be, oh, you called on me. Now I'm not going to put my camera on. So so what's the risk of transacting in this environment? You all have something that you would consider to be a risk, right? As a buyer? the risk that prices might fall, right? The overall uncertainty. Okay. Uncertainty. What else? You could make a huge you'll overpay for a house. I'm sorry. What was that? You could overpay for a house? Correct. The, the risk that you'll overpay for a house and that you'll regret it later. There's a risk that you'll overpay for the house. You might regret it. Um, somebody, Being some, disappointed that you don't get the house you want. So, so buyers, buyers remorse. Mm -hmm. Buyers remorse. Or coming in low, too low that you lose the property. Um, uh, bad strategy, right? <laughs> For making offers. <laughs> um, they feel uncertain about their investment was one, right? That their property taxes are going to go up. Taxes will go up. So now I want to point out to everybody, all of these, I'm going to go back to my document. All of these risks that we're talking about are risks of actually buying the house, right? But we're not talking about the risk of failure to take action, okay? Most, most clients will focus on the risk of buying and not the risk or cost of indecision. Okay, the cost of waiting when not purchasing. So what's the cost of indecision? you're going to lose the house, right? Because you, you, you haven't had clarity about how to make an offer. Um, what's the risk? What's the uh, risk of not buying? Okay, that, that house that you like might not be available at the same price and terms it was now, right? Um, almost certainly over time, it's going to cost more. 
Um, if rates go down, you're going to have more competition. That's a cost of indecision. If rates go up further, you're going to have to pay more at a higher rate. So if we can balance our, our mind space on the cost of, or the risks of buying and level that off with the cost of the cost and risk of indecision and waiting because that really is a true and real cost right you know how about the cost of um how important is it for you so alexa how is it important is it for you for your daughters to have two more years of having their own room while they're growing up what's the price of that you know alexa how important is it for them to be in the neighborhood that you want them to be in two years earlier Give me peace of mind to have some quiet in my house. <laughs> yep. But I mean, like, you know, the lifestyle issues, you can't get that back, right? That's correct. So so it's, it's hard to put a dollars and cents number on something so personal as, you know, where at the end of your day, you go home to spend time with your family. Okay. You know, sometimes we have to take it away from being just a pure financial decision and take it into a highly personal um, choice that they're making. All right. You know, how would you like to be communicate with and what's your availability availability when the right home comes to market? Preferred frequency <laughs> and method of communication. Many of us communicate with all of our clients the same way, right? If we like to text them on Friday afternoon, we just text them on Friday afternoon. Hey, did you see anything this week? But perhaps it makes sense to understand how they would prefer to be communicated with. And then, you know, my secret weapon, um, thank you to Angie Verstock from our um, Rockaway office for, for reintroducing this is, you know, going a little bit deeper. Okay. And um, has anybody heard of the seven levels? No. Anybody? No. So the seven levels. Yes, me, um, Rob. Sorry. So Charles, oh. you've heard about it, right? Yeah, seven levels and seventh level for the NEPQ stuff. So um, before I before I, I, I read off the sheet that you all have, you want to give um, a perspective on you know your um, understanding and value of the principle of going seven levels? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so so it's um seven seven levels. Um, I usually start my my I don't call it a presentation, but when I meet with homeowners, I typically start with what's most important to you about selling your home, and I keep careful notes. That's the first level. So it's usually very surface oriented, and then I'll ask go to the second level. I'll say, well, what about that is really important to you, and then you know. They'll tell me that. I write that down. And then I'll ask again, can you tell me more about what about that is really important to you and most important to you? So they'll usually say, hmm, never really thought about that. They'll think about it. They'll come up with an answer. And then you go again, well, what about that? And you repeat it because you want to show you're empathically listening and understanding and feeding back what it is they're telling you so they can hear it back. And then they can either correct it or they'll say, yeah, that's exactly it. And then I'll say, well, then what about that is really, really important to you? And then they'll think about it and they'll tell you. So if you do that seven times, sometimes you can get to the answer, the real answer by the fifth, sometimes by the sixth, sometimes by the seventh. Then you feed it all back to them in reverse order. And then they sit there like kind of stunned. And then they're like, wow. And then at that point, you know, they feel like you really, really understand them and what's most important to them. It's not about you. It's not about where you rank in the local market. It's not about what the home is valued at. Once they understand that you understand what's really important to them, it builds immense rapport. I found the model to be extremely useful. Right. And, and, and it, it definitely builds elevated trust and, and lower sales resistance thousand percent because then i'm seen as a advisor i'm seen as a trusted uh source reliable competent caring 
Um, it's very powerful. You can use it in personal relationships. You can use it in business. You can use it anywhere, really. It's a, it's a great methodology. And, and Charles, the interesting thing about it is it, it's not manipulative. It's basically... No, not at all. You, you have designed, to be sincere. I, yeah, it's designed to get you to understand and, and help them understand things that they might not even have thought about, right? Right. And then I can help them, you know, greater. I can provide greater value to them because I can guide them accordingly and I can advise them. It's really powerful. So, so, um, and is, is Angie on the call? Because Angie did a phenomenal job when I was starting to do the buyer um, consultation outline. And uh, Angie, thank you for your contribution, but I wanted to just share with, with you, and I probably won't do it as well as she does, but she said, tell me, what are you looking for? And they'll be like, I want a three bedroom, two and a half bath with a yard for my dog. Okay. So tell me, you know, uh, tell me more. What are you looking for? Why are you looking for that? Oh, well, because, you know, we want to have a place for our two girls to have their own room. And why is that important to you? Well, because it's important to me because I want them to have a sense of community where they live and they'll have friends and we don't have to keep moving around every three or four years. And why is that important to you? Well, I feel if they um, have a stable um, stable home that they'll be able to do better in school. And why is that important to you? Well, if they are able to do better in school, then they'll be able to live a better life and get into a good college. And then why is that important to you? Well, because then you know, my wife and I would feel like we did a great job as parents. So that was basically one of the examples that she had walked through, and I probably didn't do it justice, but you probably get the idea of asking some deeper questions. So they don't really want a three bedroom, two bath with a yard. You know, they want a, um, they don't want a house, they want a home where they can raise their family, where their children can have stability, the best opportunity to do well in school so that they can get to a good college and, and live a good life themselves. And thus the parents will feel like they did a good job parenting their kids. How's that for changes in the narrative of buying a house, right? Yeah, it's incredibly powerful. And I'll often ask them in advance. I said, this is a, this is, um, I think you'll find this of immense value. Do I have your permission, you know, to ask, what's most important to you? And they're usually like, yeah, no one's ever asked me that. And they'll look at each other and go, we've never asked each other that. <laughs> so it's a book called the seventh, seventh level or seven L it's a great book. Charles, thank you for uh, making that contribution. And absolutely. I can, I can see from some of the expressions, even some of the most senior people here, this is eye opening. Okay. It gives you an extra tool an extra resource to deliver better value because, you know, I got into real estate because I believe in, I got into this business because I believe in real estate. Okay. I believe in the principles that real estate has. You know, you've all seen last week that, um, that hazing flip book I did. And there's probably, um, it's like if I was making a movie and it, the movie was an hour and a half, there's 10 hours of, uh, clipped film on the floor there that I could have added to that. Um, but I just felt it was getting too long. But all that film that's on the ground, that's resources that I can reintroduce to somebody if it's relevant to them. If that makes any sense. Okay, because when somebody's hiring one of us, they're not hiring us for the 45 hours that it takes to complete a real estate transaction. They're hiring us for the 17,000 hours of experience we have and the investments that we make in ourselves so that we can make, you know, the process clearer, simpler, less stressful. Um, we can take the complex transaction and make it tenable. We can give them certainty in an uncertain environment. E either I've, I've gone over everybody's head, Charles, or everybody's thinking. I, I'm not sure what it is, but not many people have dropped off, so that's good. I have to say, when I heard the speaker, the author of this book, speak at a convention, I was sitting there kind of quiet myself. And I was thinking, like, wow, how powerful is this? It's really simplistic. I mean, it won't take anyone a long time to learn it. Obviously, you need to you need to feel comfortable with it. So you come across as truly caring, truly empathic, 
you know, truly concerned about, you know, the individual. And that's done with, as you know, you've talked about it before in these calls with tonality, body language, things of that nature. So, you know, it's, it's not to be used as it can be. It's like a match, right? It can be used for good or bad. Um, you can use it to manipulate. Would never advise that or recommend it. But it is a, a very powerful tool. I mean, you know, who you pick matters, right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, the the public only sees the tip of the iceberg. And if we don't educate them on what lies beneath the surface, you know, honestly, shame on us. You know, if somebody wants to buy a house in this environment and, you know, in New Jersey, we still have an extremely low inventory situation. Um, I am not concerned about it. You know, we're going to get more laser focused on what it takes. You know, we might take a look at the last five houses that have sold. We want to make sure that those houses are suitable and that they have the budget and the willingness to transact at those prices to set the right expectations so we don't set up people for failure. Right. Could right? You imagine and, and I'm sorry, Charles. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, like, can you imagine, like, everyone sitting on this call, right? What if you walked into your doctor's office and doctor, you know, does the normal pleasantries and just says to you, so, Charles, what brings you here and what's really important to you? What concerns you the most? How many doctors ask that? Very few. Go into a store. You go into a car dealership. And instead of the sales rep watching you all over the show floor, for example, instead comes over and says, hey, Mr. Horn, nice to see you. Um, may I ask you what's most important to you about selecting a vehicle or about possibly purchasing your next car? I mean, that's like a, a completely different approach than anyone. And it's very takes all that sales resistance, sales fear you know, pressure takes it way down. I mean, it's just such a, like, like, so, and Charles, one of the things that I think that, you know, probably didn't set in here, which is we can't change affordability. No, but we can look at, we can look at affordability different. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that, we can say, oh, wow, that payment's way higher. Like, you know, uh, two years ago, it would have only been, you know, 3,400. Now it's, $4,300. I, I don't know I can afford it, right? Mm -hmm. That's too expensive. My initial reaction is that too expensive relative to what? Right. Well, it just seems overwhelming. Well, you know, what happens if you stay renting, Charles? Your rent is what, $3,700? Yep. What happened the last three years? It went up two fifty dollars a year? Oh, yeah. My and, son's and rents in New York City went up one year right after COVID. After they dropped, they went up like 35 45%, and they've been going up ever since. Right. So so when somebody says that's too expensive, we have to say relative to what, right. um, you know, would it be OK if I shared with you some options so that you can make the right decision? You know, and some options might be, you know, do a one year buy down or two one buy down. So your payment is more affordable and comfortable for you the first two years. But if, you know, if Charles, you and your wife are both salaried people. And you're one of you is with the school district. Another one's a police officer. You know, your salary is going to go up, you know, 4% this year, 7% next year. Your wife's up for a promotion. She might get a 12% raise. So all these numbers are going to go up while your payment remains fixed. Mm -hmm. So in year three and four, would you agree that a $4,300 payment might be comfortable? So the real problem is not affordability. It's just your comfort for the next two years. So let me have you talk to, you know, um, Brian or Frank at our le or our preferred lender so that they can give you the information to make the right choice for you and your family. Right. I mean, you could use that question again, like what's most important? You just flip it a little bit. You say, well, what about that payment, you know, is important to you or what about that payment concerns you? Right. And then that's when you can segue, you know, depending upon how they answer. And again, it's got to be done with the intent of helping them, not to take advantage of them, not to sell them, you know, a house, whatever. Um, it's done in a genuine way. And then once you can help them, because a lot, you know, it, it includes me, right? We are myopic in terms of how we think, what we think, police values, whatever. Um, and so you can help people think through. They may have limiting beliefs that are unwarranted, but they don't know it. They think, you know, those beliefs are solid and so you can help them 
by working them through that process. Yep. I mean, there's so many options, Charles, that we can do to help people afford a house. Absolutely. So instead, instead of putting 30% down, maybe you put 20% down and you put 10% in an account and you use uh, $800 a month the first two years because that's over your comfort zone. You can restructure the way you, like the solutions are infinite. It's just the creativity that's lacking. Right. You know, there are so many ways, there are so many ways that people, you, you can look at the cost of home ownership over a seven year period and you can share with them, you know, uh, if we put $50,000 down, you know, based on the forecast of the brightest experts in the industry, Goldman Sachs, uh, CoreLogix, Zillow, you know, they all project that your house would, would appreciate 110000 in that five-year period. So if you can, if you can make $20,000 of appreciation every year for the next five years, does that make the decision a little bit more comfortable for you? And some people might say no, and that's fine, but it's, that's it's fine. our duty. It's our duty to give the options to everybody, right? You know, and if I'm doing it and saying, well, you know, you're going to say 20, blah, 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 right? Instead of just being of a consultative nature and a true fiduciary, they're going to see through that. They're going to say you have commission breath. But if I'm just saying, hey, I just want to make sure, hey, Charles, how important is it for you to have all the options so you can make the right decision? And there are a lot of options that people can have. We are we are not, you know, a, a one-legged stool here. We have lots of different choices. So, um, you know, the the scripts are are really important. I think you know what's apparent here. It's the mindset is probably even more important than the scripts. Um, and when we we did some role playing, the tendency for a lot of us was to feature dump, right? To talk about, you know, I can do this, I'll do that. This is what I do instead of saying, hey, what's important to you, right? And asking questions and then selectively identifying the tool you have in your box to solve for that problem. Because if all we do is we say all the great things that we do, if 97% of that is irrelevant to the consumer, then we're wasting their time. It's, it's really being disrespectful and, you know, foolish. And in this business, you know, I, I used to feel that when I watch somebody take a client out and they work with them for three months and then they buy with somebody else or they decide to renew their lease and you get paid zero for all your time, you've invested money, you might have taken them out to a couple of lunches, you spent money on gas. Like, wow, sometimes this business can be really unfair. But as I matured, I realized that, you know, what, this business is completely fair. And when that happens, it's not a, a time to be disappointed or angry. It's a time to reassess, you know, what you did wrong. Because, you know, yes, you didn't get paid, but unfortunately your consumer is not in their new home. And we have accountability for that. So I think the business is fair. You know, you could, uh, you could text me hate mail later, but I do, I do think it's fair. And I think that, you know, we don't blame. We just look at, you know, what can we have done better? Rob, I, I think using this method, it will differentiate us from the other realtors out there because they're always talking about I'm number one, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, instead of engaging. And I think mm -hmm. that that's what we need to concentrate, what's going to set us apart from the others and make and let people know that we really are concerned in helping them. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, honestly, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe in the people that we've attracted to our, our organization, Colleen, that we do want to help. Right. And you know, my mission is just to give you the strategy to let people see what your true colors are and how you do care. Right. Yep. You know, so, Robbie, going back to the beginning of this conversation where you talked about, you know, you never want to ask them if they're working with another agent, you know, so the way around it, one of the, the go arounds was, you know, have you seen houses in the market? Um, and obviously that 
is a sentence that can kind of lead to your seven level of questions. Yeah, you didn't see the house that you wouldn't want it to buy, but there are things about them that were really of importance to you. And if so, what were they? And um, it just kind of leads its way right into the conversation. Yep. I mean, there was a uh, there was a song by Toby Keith. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. Oh I yeah. I want to talk about number one. Oh my. What I think. <laughs> what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I like talking about you, but let's talk about me. <laughs> you can always so, relate this to dating too, Rob, right? You wouldn't, you know, if you're, in, if you're a man and you're interested in a woman, one of your first questions wouldn't be, do you have a boyfriend? Right. <laughs> like, run, she'd run from you right. or him, whatever. So, so you're, 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 it's about the, re, it's about the relationship and it's about like, I know that everybody on this call cares. And if you can have the strategy to share with people that you care and you have the skills to educate them about what ownership, what home ownership means, and maybe not look at that month three, but look at that over a period of five to seven years. And then when you say it's too expensive, you know, when somebody says that's, that's too expensive, that rate is too high. Your commission is too high. Compared to what? Well, it's too expensive compared to what? You, it, it, it's a lot more expensive if you want to stay in rent for seven years, right? And would you would you agree that you know, maybe the lifestyle might be a little bit greater? You know, and what's the what's the what's the price of your daughter not being in the school district you want her to be in? You know, wh how would you how would you factor that into the equation, the math equation? You can't, right? Right. Yeah. How would you factor not having the place to have the holiday of your dream where your whole family can come over to the house that you're proud of that's decorated that you want? What's the price tag on that, Alexa? There's no price tag on that. That's memories that I will always have. And, and it's not, I'm not a manipulative person. I'm somebody who believes in what I do. You know, I believe in home ownership. We went over that last week. Like every single law and rule is designed to benefit homeowners. Tax exemption, tax benefits, appreciation, compound appreciation, amortization. Um, you, you can shelter your income through depreciation if you rent it out. You have liquidity by taking a home equity loan. You're in the only country where you have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Rates go down, you win. Rates go up, you win. Like, what's the risk? Right. I mean, the bet is the game is all rigged in our advantage. We just don't have the communication skills or the courage to have those conversations to help people identify what's what's right for them. So I always talk too much. We're four minutes over. Any other questions? I, I hope I hope not only, you know, did you find this um, educational, but I hope you can find it actionable and, you know, talk to your people about the affordability and the cost of home ownership over the period that they want to be there. You know, talk to them about what's the price tag on, you know, foregoing two or three years of having that house where you can get together for the holidays or your kids can have the, you know, the playroom and the bedroom that they wanted or be in the school district that they wanted or start to form relationships with friends in the neighborhood that you want them to be in. It's almost uh, priceless. Can, uh, can Charles please uh, put into the chat the name of the book for the seven principles? I'll put it. I'll put it into the um, into the document that's attached to the email everybody got. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody have a fantastic, uh, productive weekend, and um, let's get excited to have these conversations, and let's go, let's get off talking about I and talk about them. And Talk happy about Father's you. Day. Very helpful, happy Father's Day. Thank you. Very happy Father's, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day, everybody. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Happy Father's Thank, Day. You. Thank you. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.